My name is Jen MacArthur. I'm one of the co-chairs of our lecture committee here in the Department of Architectural Science. And it's my pleasure to, in, to thank you all for coming tonight for this lecture and to introduce Christoph Dunzer, who's our speaker for the evening. Christoph is an Austrian architect and the partner of Hermann Kaufmann Architects from Schwarzach, Austria, along with Stefan Hebler and Roland, and Roland Weheger. And if I pronounce this properly, I've got my ties to thank. Christoph's career path parallels the surge in wood and in fact is an epitomize in this presentation, demonstrating how increased competence and understanding of how wood can be used in small projects and how this experience leads to effective use of this natural material in increasing large and more complex structures. Christoph has been the lead designer for a wide variety of innovative wood structures, from small remote passive design residential structures using CLT to multifamily residential buildings to larger commercial and institutional buildings. In 2010, he began working on a breakthrough building that brought together composite design, prefabrication, ultra high performance, and rapid construction. That project culminated in Life Cycle Tower One in Donbirn, Austria, an eight story tall structure made using prefab mixed material elements and was erected in eight days in March 2012. He's also worked with Aston Austi Architects in the tallest contemporary wood structure in the world, his 18 story Brock Commons building at UBC. And the UBC uh, civil engineering faculty rave about that building everywhere that they go. So I got an earful about it last week, they love it. With his passion for timber construction, Christoph will be discussing how wood can offer significant solutions for the future of the built environment. Wood sets limits, yet allows manifold applications. It is precisely these challenges that make designing a building with wood so fascinating and make successful projects an exciting source of inspiration for the future. You know what? It's a very long bio. I'm sure you'd much rather hear Christoph speak. So without further ado, please welcome Christoph Bisler. So first, thank you for the invitation. I'm very far from home, really abroad. I think I know some of you from, I think some of you toured to the ICDM. And, oh, should start the presentation first. So this presentation is, is not really an architect's presentation because it, it, it's partly <coughs> meant as a car a thought of the carpenter or someone who's doing a real crafts work and it got a, a big part on research on it. I like the romantic idea that our forefathers lived a little bit more in balance with nature than we do now. And if you see those structures we have in the Alps, like these, some of these buildings are 300 years old and the climate is very harsh, there's deep snow in winter and there's like 30 degrees in the summer. And our forefathers could manage to, to erect buildings of, uh, made of a biodegradable material that could last for 300 years, which is absolutely mind-blowing if you think about the, the things we do now. We have like a problem building buildings that last for 40 years. So this is one of my first projects I ever did. I had to replace this one. This one burned down. And we had to do a reinterpretation of this. It's 100% wood. And it was prefabricated, brought to the place. And pretty much we are still able to do the same things that we could do in the past. And they, I think we, with caused by the machine, we are a little bit more accurate than they were. And we have like better wood because <clears throat> we just buy it somewhere. And it's, it's a very feasible project. I like that very much because it's 100% wood and nothing else. But this kind of technique is not, not a thing that we can do in a big size. This is, if, if you refer to Buckminster Fuller, who always f uh, had the question, what way is your construction? This is a bad sign for this construction, because this is heavy timber. And uh, a modern building should show different as aspects of, of a modern construction. The, the project I want to show first is a conversion we did, or a renovation we did for years now. It's uh, one of the oldest buildings in Vorarlberg. It's a Pope's Die, which is a monastery, it's a kind of monastery, it's not a monastery anymore. 
and we did a conversion there. Like the building we built the restaurant in is from 1648, I think, and we built a restaurant underneath the whole building. And what is remarkable remarkable about this building, this uh, structure with wood nails, is from 1653 and still like in, in very good shape. We did nothing. We didn't repair anything there. And we had to put in a, a, an additional slab for to divide the restaurant from it was a former stable. And we went for a timber hybrid construction, like 24 centimeters of beams in, in wood and 14 centimeters of uh, concrete, which is not a very efficient construction. You don't even have to calculate that. That's given that this fire overdone and then the structural engineer had, was a lot, had not, never ever done before a timber hybrid construction. So it was very ineffective, very insufficient, and it was not a good solution to it. It took a lot of time to install it. It was the opposite of what we're trying to do, to prefabricate, to install a building, not to build it. And in the end, we had this lab that was very heavy, was very inefficient, and for the next uh, section, I thought we can do better. And I organized a prefabricated timber hybrid slab. This is 16 centimeters of CLT and I guess 10 centimeters of concrete, the same span, and prefabricated, and the whole building is resting on, on the old construction. And the, the, the goal was to be as fast as possible because underneath that slab we had uh, the renovation was done the year before so we are very sensitive about uh, the the weather situation so we closed it very fast and it was a first thing that we need to be more industrial in, in our approach we need to have like a little bit more uh, <coughs> standardization in 2000, I think in Austria there came a, a database which, is, which helps you a lot like to give you an idea of what is a construction where you can choose whatever co components you want, choose different types of all these uh, constructions are approved by university and, and by laboratories and you end up with a construction you have like the acoustic performance, uh, the span you can maximize the fire resistance and so that gives you a little bit of standardization but this is not enough for, for uh, having uh, a very fast erection, you need a modular system, you need more, uh, uh, you need to plan more like uh, from, from you need to think about how you're going to install the building very fast because the thing we fear is the water, not the the fire. So we end up with a we finished that uh, renovation part in a very nice way. I think it's a very atmospheric thing. We just add one cube for the kitchen in in in, in the backyard, and from inside we used a lot of of ash because the ash is dying at the moment in Europe by a fungus and the it's a responsibility from the architect to, to look a little bit in the in the woods to to show what what do the the, the owners get money for and the ash is the, the ash price is down to like spruce at the moment. No one takes it out of the woods. So it was our task to, to do a lot of uh, ash in that project, which pays really off because it's a very nice, it's all natural wood. It's uh, with bandsaw cut, gives a certain surface, very nice thing. It's very resistant to dirt. Nothing is, no, no paint on it. It's just raw timber. I think a very nice shine on it. It's a very nice roof and a very nice room too. So we end up with a very atmospheric project. We tried to standardize buildings and then once uh, Mr. Suteluti, who is the owner of a supermarket chain, came to us and, and, and said, I want to build a prototype and want to build that prototype 10 times every year one. And we started with like in with Suto Ludiweiler is, is like, yeah, it's not really a village, it's just uh, a few houses around here, and we developed like a basilica like prototype. We wanted to have like, uh, he wanted to sell 
especially products that are produced nearby, and you want to show that by, by the architecture. You want it to be <coughs> seen as the one who cares about uh, what we build around our cities. And so we developed this construction, and we couldn't manage to, to have like a wooden construction if we made no floor construction at all. It's just, it's just a, a, a concrete plate. And so we erected it pretty fast, prefabricated, brought to place, and the slab was poured afterwards. It's red concrete. Without a floor construction, we, we could pay for that construction on, on top of it. It's a very nice thing. But the main problem we faced was how often does an architect do the same building twice or for, it's, it never happens. And uh, the owner of a supermarket chain want always to be more effective, cheaper. So you always have to change and there's no prototypic solution. It's again a one-off after one-off after one. And this is the, the opposite of a system. This one looks a little bit different. This is a cheaper construction. You can't go, this is a span of 20 meters, and the cheaper thing that I can imagine to do for a supermarket. Still, it's an atmospheric scenery compared to other supermarkets we have in Austria. But again, it's not a system. It's, it's a one-off. And the next one I love always when I see them was not the third, but it was one in a row and, and, and proved that there's no system in, in it, it was also a, 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 a big span, I think 20 meters, same construction as the, as the other one, but we put beams down there to have a different slab. A lot of things were prefabricated, brought very fast on site. The erection phase is pretty fast, and we ended up with like a very unique building. We tried to, to have like a twisting facade to something that Wood is normally not made for. We, we twisted it a little bit, like we have this round shape, and then have a, a different shop inside. The one, the one thing that we always do in the office is a lot of research. In, in, in 2004, we were invited to do the community center in Ludesh, and the goal was to, how can we get rid of all the poison that we put in the building by just having adhesives that are poisonous, that having like materials that gas out something which is not really healthy, and are we able to get rid of them without, um, without <coughs> Uh, additional costs to the bat to the budget, so we had like double bidding, uh, double, double tender processes. We ended up with a project. They wanted to have like a, a market yard and three single buildings, which is a community. Sounded like uh, a big uh, uh, the postal office, and, and there's a, a meeting room, big, and 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 the bank is up there. This is a floor plan. And the, they went for a wooden building because the, the city owns themselves wood, and we did a completely uh, <coughs> construction in wood. We didn't know, we didn't know, uh, we didn't use any uh, <coughs> panels. We always just raw sawn timber, a diagonal cladding for stiffening the the hollow body construction. The fire protection was done. The iron parts were protected by wood. And so we ended up with a construction. This is really nice place, a marketplace. There's a solar uh, uh, panels on, on top of the marketplace, and it's, it's, it's very often used for market. And then the inside, everything is like uh, raw on timber, untreated wood. And if you're in the building, you can smell it. It's, it's, it's a very nice atmosphere inside. And we did not only, you, it is a passive, it was a passive house. It was not so common in 2005 with 13.8 kilowatt hours per square meter in a year, with the ever, whereas the average of these 60 years had 85. So we got a lot better than that. We have reduced the, the global warming potential by, by a factor of five, I guess. And the main thing is, at that time, it was the first project where we measured the air quality after we erected the building. So we could do better on, on 
the VOC, formal the hidden VOC by looking at the adhesives and the, especially at the furniture, because the furniture is like brings a lot of poison into the building. But the main thing is this guy told me on side, this is the first time that I insulate the windows and, have, and don't have a niche on, on my arms. And the question is, why, don't we, why, do, why do we use materials that give the works a niche and we're surround, surrounded by these materials? And I ask an, a, specialist, a specialist about what, how can an architect figure out what was poisonous and what is not. And he told me that's a simple thing. If you want to, if, if, just in case, think about would you eat it? You're pretty sure about that. If, if you're willing to eat it, just in case, it's not poison. You're sensoric, like your nose and your mouth give you like a perfect <coughs> instrument to, to decide whether it's good or not, it's not good. But the one thing that put us in a plan for a complete new development was in 1997. It was our first passive house and it was a building system. That's what we gonna wanted to do. Still, a, a passive house, our first passive house in 1997, and we're still discussing the same thing, still. So you, you might imagine we're not moving very fast. But this one was years before, like the carpenters industry in, in, in Forbeck was at the point that you can have a tender process for that. Everything was prefabricated, even the bathrooms and brought in, was installed on site within a week. See, completely prefabricated bathroom with the tubes in it. Afterwards, there's a prefabricated riser shaft that just connected, plugged in, and so you're done. And this is the main principle from the system. How you can get the load through the slab without compressing the, the wood fibers 90 degrees to the uh, fiber di direction. If you want to have like uh, an acoustic performance, you need masses. So there's uh, <coughs> a little, uh, pebbles inside and, and uh, an insulation so don't have any resonance in the, in the, in the building. It was a very complicated thing to have, like very complicated gasket designs because although this is a passive house, so you need an air dense envelope. The parts were brought with the, you see a very complicated design at that time that we improved that step by step a little bit. But main thing is you could do better. That was at 97, that was the highest building you were allowed to build in wood in Austria at that time. The first condominium made of wood and was installed within a week. In 2004, we won a competition in Murwek Wien, which was a, a social housing for 84 uh, uh, apartments. And we thought that the client wanted to have a lot of the same kind of an apartment. So we went for a CLT construction. And that's like a lessons learned project. Low building structure goes that direction, and isolating structure goes in that direction, except this wall. And our idea was, if you have a lot of the same size and the same shape walls, you can prefabricate them in CLT, and you have a very effective construction, because all the low building structure is given by the walls itself, and there was the belief you can easily prefabricate and install the system. Turned out in Vienna, you were not allowed to have like combustible uh, facade materials outside, so we had to do an extra research on how could we prevent the fire from spreading one level to another. If you build a house, occasionally it will burn. No matter what material you use, you have to take care about that. So if the fire occurs, you won't, you can't prevent that ha from happening. But you can prevent the fire from spreading one level to the next level. So we decided to have like a special design with like metal sheetings every level. And we proved with a fire test, if you have 15 centimeters of uh, uh, metal sheet and the can delivers outside of the cladding, the fire, which is like a, a norm uh, test we have to do in Austria, like it's one cubic meter of wood in the corner of a building. It's the worst situation you can face. And 
we could prove that the fire stops itself, no matter what is up there. There's a, the same thing as a combustible material, and, and the fire didn't cross that line. So we ended up with that detail, and that gave us the opportunity to build an exception to the code. Everything was prefabricated in Forberg. This is one of the buildings completely done. And this, is the, this shows the big mistake later on. Everything is made of CLT, and, and the whole world is doing that at the moment because it's this, I think, the simplest method to, to, to get a building because it's, it's not really an engineered building system. You use a lot of wood, more wood than you even need for anything, but think about these walls are all, are all load-bearing to have like small spans. And the problem with that is, if you have to fire protect them, the surface is enormous. So you will never meet the budget for uh, <coughs> compared to other construction types. So you have to change it. You have to be more focused to have like a more sophisticated system. F system worked very well. Is, is we, all the walls, the insulated walls, we used to wipe the vapor barrier for weather protection. The CLT can cope with a little bit of snow. Was installed. It's about 8,700 square meters and was installed in six weeks. Pretty fast for for the Vienna Viennese guys. Not very fast compared to Austria, but it was quite a number to to live in a building that fast. And it was the first social housing in Vienna that has like a wooden cladding in it. And, and and was sold out very quick. In 2009, uh, a builder, the Rombergbau, invited us to have a research on, on uh, uh, <coughs> timber tower. And we went for research, for, for the research we had thought about a 20-story building, because in that time, 2009, no, no one ever thought about that this is reason, it is doable from the code or from a structural point of view, and this is like the iconic uh, floor plan we had. If you want to prefabricate and install a system very fast, you don't, you're obliged to, to get rid of all diagonals inside the facade like modern skyscraper to have. So it's a core uh, skyscraper. Every, all the loads that go, which come horizontally to the building go back to the core and from the core down to the ground that guarantees you that you can do that, and that's the big change. We, in, we wanted to install like the load-bearing structure at the same time as the envelope. Still thinking about a passive house, so having a super dense envelope. So this is the challenge to have something erected at the same time, and, and that speed is unbeatable, I think. For the research, we went like, thought about Doable would be 1,000 square meters a day warm, and you can <clears throat> start to to install the heating system the day too. The look of the building shouldn't be like a, a Alp Chalet. It could be covered with every facade you can imagine. Main outcome of the system was like have a very simple idea. Normally we put in a screen or some pebbles inside to have the, the, the structural load to, to get around the, the uh, uh, acoustical performance. Most codes in, in, in Europe to afford a layer of uncombustible material. So we thought normally we put in a screen and we don't want to have like a to pour a screed inside a, a wooden building because it bring humidity, we want to prefabricate that. So we went for a timber highway construction, like this was the first layout. It was calculated by Ove Arup, and it was 18 centimeters of concrete and 18 centimeters of wood beams, which is not very sexy because they decided that the wood is, in, in the case of fire, is not load bearing anymore. And we found out that that was a crucial error. But for the, for the structural analysis, it was good to have someone who's, who's, who was able to do the dynamic research on, on this with a very heavy timber construction. Second point was all the loads have to go along the fibers. <coughs> so we needed to have like a connection detail over there, the same detail that I showed you from 1997, <coughs> but a little bit more sophisticated. 
timber hybrid, the reason is that this is spruce against concrete. Spruce can take three times more load than concrete. Just the steel in the concrete makes it more durable than, than wood. The one thing that we want to have, we want to do, uh, like bring elements to the side. We have, uh, if you have like a system who guarantees you a fire resistance, who guarantees you like a structural point of thing, it's easy for every architect to work with. So our first prototype was like, we have to do a formwork, bring in the beams, do the uh, uh, irons, uh, the steel on, on, on top of it, and then pour the concrete on it. And these are like the first two elements we produced. It was in a very old-fashioned concrete facility. And we, the first learn thing, the first thing we learned was workers there do get gloves only once a year. So all the gloves are black. And you see their fingerprints all over the construction, and the construction is visible in our case always. So it's kind of like it's where the, the learning process started was at the concrete facility. They couldn't decide which side of the beam was the, the be more beautiful one, so we put an A on it, but they never got the idea of the A and the B side of the beam, so they're all mixed up, and they ended up like having the bad side of the beam at the, uh, at the, at the window side, for example. We had to do fire tests to be uh, uh, to get a permission for an eight-story building. This shows the oven, which is in Czech Republic. It's 8.10 meters long in that direction and, and 2.70 meters in that direction. It's the old, uh, the old structure, the uh, the over hour slab. Fire test is a uh, load brought on and. This is just, I think, 10 minutes after ignition, and you can see something's going terribly wrong. You see, like, the distance hose and mel melting off, and there's probably you can see the iron. After a few minutes more, you can see there's something terribly wrong. No one thought about that. If, if you ever hear someone who tells you he'd rather go into a, a concrete building that is burning than in a wooden building, I can give you like a sample of the fire test acoustically. We have a film. All these material, like this big size concrete things, exploded down to 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 the oven and destroyed all the measure the instruments. From the upside, you can see that something is terribly wrong. And after 37 minutes, something happened that was not foreseen by the code because the Euro code, which gives you allowance for for 90 minutes fire resistant just by the code without any test with 10 centimeters of concrete. That could happen, but normally after two or three years, and the first thing was that we had to improve the construction and, and the concrete. So we rearranged the beams to change the structural engineer to Mertz Clay and Partner, which is the one uh, we have like, around next door. And this is the fire test when it and runs normally. This is ignition just before flashover, like a, and this is flashover at 1,000 degrees and, and underneath the, the slab. And at the end of the test, we didn't extinguish the slab. We just hung it up in, 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 in the facility. And the, the jarring of the wood uh, stops the glowing. And then it, it stops, the fire stops by itself. In the end, we had to put polypropylene fibers inside the concrete so that this gives way for the vapor that runs out of the concrete so the concrete could stand the uh, fire test too. Wood burns like predicted 0 0.6 millimeters per minute is very predictable and you see all things, all beams are, are the same way. Uh, uh, um, we build a mock-up one goal for the the construction we have a what to have a like a, a very light construction three slabs on a on a truck was like the research idea because we want to have like an effect and a very efficient transportation a slab with 8.10 meters and 2.6 meters uh, wide has a weight of like six tons 
And this is again one mistake we used, like concrete workers for installation of the system. See then brought down, there's a pin and there's like a, a hole in, in the slab and this is like the main main problem we faced, that the saying in German, eventually use a shim plate to rearrange it. There's something we are not used to because the carpenter works down, to, the carpenter's accuracy is down to below a millimeter. The accuracy of a concrete worker is by, I think, around 10 millimeters sometimes on good days. <laughs> so we had to redesign because there's two lobbies and two industries come together with a hybrid slab and everyone has his own set of accuracies and, and so we have to design a, a new detail. This is a section through the wall, like this is the column, this is the uh, insulating part of the wall and we just uh, put a pin on top of the column. Then we slide in the first slab, then there's a, a grouting for positioning and this, pin, this, uh, <clears throat> this pipe always stands 10 millimeter more than the maximum tolerance of the slab above the level of the concrete. So the next part has like, on the base of the column has a pin and the pin goes in the column. So you transfer the accuracy of the carpenter back to the accuracy of the carpenter without having any problems or issues with the uh, concrete levels you see here. And this is so important because we have like still an envelope that is should, supposed to be closed by a millimeter and so you have this strong and groove connection which close air dents the system which is very crucial if you want to have like a rec fast erection phase. And then you have the grouting afterwards and then and the whole base of the, the column is low bearing. So end of life, a lot of you will have done this in life cycle analysis. What, what's at the end of life? Put in some numbers. We hired some students to, to, to get uh, the thing uh, disassembled again, and they were allowed to use everything they can imagine to disassemble the system. And the goal was, can, are we able to, to um, <clears throat> disassemble just, just a slab and reuse it? Because reuse would be the better solution than just <clears throat> destroy it. So for that, connection was a good solution, but you see like here in the corner and, and we, we use like <coughs> spiral tubes and the spiral tubes have like the problem that you can't get the grouting out again and so you destroy the corner of the element. So if you want to reuse them, you have to change that detail. Mr. Romwing was very motivated by uh, the uh, <coughs> research and allowed us to build one, a quarter of the building on one of his uh, uh, facilities. And this is just a quarter of the tower. It's, if you mirror that by that, these both axes, then you have like these thousand square meters. And we wanted to prove that we can go as high as possible or allowed in, in Austria. In Austria, it's the case if everything below 22 meters high as f floor plan, is not a skyscraper, and so you don't have to face that harsh regulations. So this is just close to a high-rise building. Main idea was still the words should be visible. Everything visible, you can extinguish pretty fast. Prefabrication is like a little bit in the car industries. It's it's our main goal. Our companies do all have big <coughs> facilities where they can work like the car industries. Put the mo put the modules in row and just under warm, safe conditions, they bring these parts together. Even the taping of elements is. is that you do in, in a warm condition. This is like the first element to come from the corner. The, you see low bearing structure, the envelope, windows in, even the reed contacts for, the, for window closes are mounted and the sea sliding down the tongue roof connection. And went very well, this is after two hours you have the wall segments installed and then every five minutes you can fly in a deck. I recognized when I saw a, a carpenter positioning the, the, the one slab by, with his feet while phoning that the system works, is, has a very 
robust handling. And that's what it's all about. Eight stories, we promised to do it in eight days, and uh, for that erection phase, you only need four people. And if they work regularly, 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 they would just need half a day for uh, for one level, and you can see them speed up and later on. And main goal would would have been if the interior <coughs> interaction starts right now. So you bring in the the like aeration and stuff like that at that stages and just get fast. For this particular place, we had a bad weather cast for the, for the weekend, so the, the site was very small, so we decided to go for a roof for weather protection. And you can see, like, this is something very diff different to the, the standard way of building a building. Everything is done pretty fast to reduce the risk of getting soaked during erection phase, because you don't want to be soaked with a, with a wooden building, and this is the reason why. Even in May, you can face like hard weather changes, and you don't want to have like water inside the construction. So we have all <coughs> all this uh, expansion from from the wood. So after half a day, you face this. It's a very clean site, very uncommon. It's an installation site, not a building site. And from the outside, we used a, a non an, an aluminum sheeting because you're not allowed to use a combustible material outside for uh, nature story building in Austria at the moment. Maybe that changes for the future. And inside, it has a very wooden touch. There's an exhibition on where we show all the techniques used in, inside the building. While working on this this proto this uh, lab system, we won a competition with the system, which, which is the ICDM. It's again also a passive house, same system but completely different building, and we were able to to win the competition before we got permission for the system itself. So it was kind of a stress to to get all the approvals to erect the building. The fantastic thing about using a system, this is from the competition. I think we changed a little bit the roof, the fore roof, but the rest is just like we built it. It's a double span system, like the, we used like a, a steel beam to cross with the aeration because you need, for passive house, you need an aeration. But it was built like it is shown here, exactly from the scratch. This is a very unique thing that we do. It's the last time when you see all the co components together. In, in, in <clears throat> Here we wanted able to install the windows inside the, the elements because we want to have three field elements. And this is triple layer glasses, huge glasses, big spans. And the elements would have been too, too heavy. So we decided to go for, for installing them extra to have like a very high light intake point because there's no flash or no meat for for uh, like a, a beam that stiff is, would stiffen these elements. Again, same system, but different approach to it, towards it. There's three column rows and this small wall segment brought together, brought the, at the same top of the pin then the window is coming, and that's the crucial difference. Where the the LCT one had a detail where you have like a bath tube because the the point where you want to have uh, uh, taped the vapor bear was on top of the of the slab. You want to have like a weather protection that looks like that to hang up like a membrane in case of bad weather situation. So you should look about these details very early to get a weather protection about that. It is, the rest is mounted like we did before. It was a very spectacular sign. One third of the building is inside the sea, and the sea is leveling itself every six hours from zero to five meters with a concrete part of, of the concrete art piece of it. And here's the first parts flying in. 
pretty much the same system. Wind and broth afterwards that the vapor bear goes along that connection and all the taping comes from the outside, not from the inside, because the inside is the visible side. Uh, this building has like 10,000 square meter and was installed in six weeks. It's pretty fast at the end of the year. It's probably the only technique you can achieve this so late in the year, like late October. We started and six weeks later we finished. One thing that we all forget about is that wood <coughs> forces you to, to think about how you get the quality you really want. The knowledge how you really mill wood vanishes a little bit away, even in, also in Austria. So this is, he's very happy because he found like a spruce for, for a ceiling that normally goes, or well, this is not spruce, that's right for normally goes to, to the veneer industry and we ask him to do like uh, a report on, on that like a sustainable report for the for the certifications and he draws how he's going to mill the tree and what part is he uses normally this part of the tree which is goes there never leaves the um, milling facility. It goes back in th in, into the fire for the heating of the, dry, of the dryer of the facility. And he, said about, he once said to me, I'm fed up with all this discussion about uh, sustainability. My idea is I run my business after benediction rules and waste to the benediction rules is a sin. So he tries to find use for every part of it. Normally you can't use the heart of a tree because there's a lot of cracks in it. So he used them in invisible subconstructions over there. So that way he could be the same price than someone who orders just a wood from Siberia and brought into Austria, which is ridiculous. So the one thing is very special using timber is like, you have always watched the earrings. So this is the 52 segment. He cut off the tree before, like you see, all these 52s, so on that way. And that's the next step to, to achieve five lats. You want to have the earrings always standing up or 45 degrees. That, is, that delivers you a very stable lat with, with, uh, that has no tendency to turn and twist a little bit. So it's, it's given by the milling process how the wood performs in the end. Everything was mounted on a, on a frame in a shop, brought to the site, so you can achieve amazing quality on site. You have no process on site, that, uh, no saw, no <coughs> changing of the materials. It's just an installation. So you end up with a very nice view. This is a very wooden building. It's, it's, it is a passive house, but you don't feel being in a passive house. The main thing that you feel is like an atmospheric working space. That's the main goal. It's just a few from the interviews and the main, this is the main entrance. There's a few cinemas and meeting rooms up there, and there's a, uh, <coughs> a 60 meter long uh, couloir where you can see the slab always. And normally, these uh, normally these slab you see some lats twist and turn, and that disturbs the build the, the the image of the the slab after three heating periods. Not a lot of the lats turned. This is uh, the restaurant, which is above the sea level. It's a pretty nice place to be. And from the outside, we use like for the protection of uh, weather protection, uh, for roof at every level because weather conditions there are very rough. While working on this project, we thought about a new evolution of the slab to have more flexibility to have like. Uh, not, not being forced to deliver wood beams to a, a, a concrete facility. We thought about a screwed wood concrete composite floor. We wanted to have thermal component activation because there's already a screed in, why not a heated screed for that? And we wanted to have more flexibility and more like 
things that a concrete worker is able to do. So we ended up like with this kind of new type, of kind of the blue pipes are the heating and cooling device. This uh, pipes give way for the uh, screws. And you have a very simple prefabricated element with the heating. We built up a prototype. Here you can see the screws going in and with did a lot. The, the fantastic thing about screwing the things is that can, you can push back the flexion and screw it down so you have a pretense slap. So you reduce the flex of this slab by 50%, which is if we have a big span, like quite a, re a relief on it. The natural frequency is designable with the screws. Is It's above eight and a half uh, hertz, which is pretty good for our lightweight construction. It's something you have to meet in Germany. If, and normally, wood constructions are at four to six hertz. It's before you put load in it. And again, end of life was like a big discussion. Normally, you think about like if you screw the connection, you can easily screw them out. But a screw is a very sufficient part of industry. And if you screw them out, you will break, I think, 10% of the screws because they are done to a limit. So again, way back to the screw maker to design different screws that you can unscrew once without destroying this. So you can lift up the concrete bar without destroying it. And we found a building, uh, we found a client for the research, the little research on the screw timber construction. This is a section through the building. He wa the client wants to have like a, a brick facade and a wooden building. And this is the first um, building we got an, an award for a brick award and a wood award. And this is a, a more wooden construction, like the beams are in wood, uh, so don't, you don't have the concrete beams here. And one part of the column goes through the beam to take care of the loads going vertical so you don't compress the wood and have like a settlement in the wood. And this is so precise that these uh, guys are delivered with different humidities. So you can just once put them together and if, if they naturally get their moisture equilibrium, you can't um, disassemble them easily. You need a crane to just because they're just sucked into it. It's a very simple construction. Transport is more effective than it was before. Installation is a little bit slower, but still pretty fast. We have a lot of screws. This is a research project. We have three times more screws than needed. And from the inside, is, we use beech. Beech is also a tree that is not very much used anymore in, 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 in OHs in the woods. So we tried to have like a beech, and we didn't sort it out. So there's different colors of beech in It's a very nice touch, sorrow. And from the outside, there's a brick building with a nice facade on it. And then in, I think in, we got invited by Act Nostra Architects to be part of a competition to run for the UBC Vancouver. And we could won that competition. And there, we had to come up with a very efficient construction. Every honeycomb construction has too much, much wood, too much fire protective surface. So we decided to go for a very simple idea to have just columns and slabs and the curtain wall, like uh, <coughs> Corbusier wanted it. So you have like three field slabs, just columns. This is again the connector, you remember 1997, the same connection detail that we used. We, we went for uh, like a, a steel part of it because it's uh, more convenient for the Canadians to do that. They're not, the accuracy of carbon in Canada wasn't that precise that it was in, or that it is in Austria, so they felt better going for concrete, uh, for a steel connector. And you end up with a system that has no beams, horizontal beams inside. That's a big advantage because if you think about all the systems that you have mounted over there, so they don't have any holes that you have to fire protect. So it's a very simple, very robust approach to that thing. We built a mock-up. There you see, like, this is the Austrian column top. This is the Canadian one. They couldn't manage to, or they, they went for that because it's safer for them. They felt better doing that detail. And I think still that's, that's 
pretty cool seeing a deck flying in. And then we had the installation. It was unbelievable. It's the first 80 story building. We erected like these uh, uh, steel cores before. And then we used a pretty simple system. It is not so prefabricated as we used to do it because it's kind of like different. If you have like a, if you work a road, you have to respect the, the way that people build over there. So normally, we would install, we would have installed these uh, columns within a, a wall. They, were, they felt better doing the columns just per hand and just single. So they're using a very simple system. They brought the column, brought it on top of the same device. Then they <coughs> uh, fixed it, and they use like distant holders to, to assure a grid, and delivered one slab, and you see how precise that works. And it's something that, at the beginning, they couldn't imagine to be that the kind, the kind of accurate. They were very <coughs> amazed that the architect was reading the technical specification for the CLT boards and discovering that the uh, tolerance would allow 10 millimeters of tolerance uh, after 10 meters. And that's something that you can't tolerate building up an 80-story building. So we called Hundecker. Why is that? Uh, why do, they're using the same machinery that they use in, in Europe, and they end up with a 10 millimeter tolerance. And so they called them in BC. And the fact is that they normally produce the CLT boards for uh, roads in the permafrost area in summer to to run heavy machinery above it. So there's no need for the accuracy. And so. They never ever adjust the machinery for the right setting. So, after doing that, they could meet the requirements pretty good. And it's just nice how precise it worked. See, you know, the, the pinholes met every time, very, very, very safe. A very wooden construction. The only thing that the <coughs> that we uh, would do different, like the acoustical performance here in Canada is, is not the same as in in, in Austria. You, in Austria, we would not be allowed to do that kind of uh, uh, acoustical performance. But they said that it's more important to have like a cheap apartment for uh, students than having uh, acoustical performance. They have to learn to to live with each other for that particular time. <laughs> so I'm not sure about that approach. Then they brought on the, like a curtain wall. The curtain wall, you have pretty much more experience than we have, like something that you, is very uh, common here, not used in Europe very much. And here you can see the approach. We asked them from the beginning on to install the column with the facade, so the facade would never be late, because the facade protects the, the building from getting soaked. And for the first two levels, they had heavy rains, and they got soaked. And all the promises I made them fulfilled by the first few weeks. But then they took care about that. And the, the facade was never so late as it used to be in the first days. I think it's 14,000 square meters erected in nine and a half weeks. They could have done faster, but we had to wait for the settlement of the columns while the extra load from, from the interior extension was brought in. The shrinking of the building alongside all the columns is five centimeters in total. So we have to take into account that the building settles a little bit. And there was a really safe and fast erection. It's unbelievable. And this was the first one first time that I recognize is a really, really high building, doable, feasible in, 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 as a wooden construction. And it opened the door for, I think, a lot of things to come. At the end, I want to show you something that I, my heart is bleeding for. This, this is also really high. This is 2,200 meters in the Alps. And after all the systematic approach, a lot of people ask, can you do round shapes? Yes, we can. You can do hand-milled CLT rounded, probably with a helicopter. 
you have to have like a very robust set of details, completely different approach, but the same thing, you have to erect it fast because time is very limited. You're limited to 700 kilograms per element. You just have these tiny helicopters to install the building. But the approach is pretty much the same. You have to think about the prefabrication while the planning process. So we ended up having a completely rounded shape. Once we uh, detected that we, we've got like the idea making a round shape, we make we made everything wrong. All the lopian structure going is bended and around the corners. And so we ended up with a very round building on top of a mountain, which is really nice. It's a triple layer glass brought to place. It's the maximum, the, the helicopter. It's, it was heavy. We told him it's about 700 kilograms, but I think it was 800. It could cope with that and everything and the building is round and special made for that. And the fantastic thing about that, everything is prefabricated, brought into place, and with a rounded shape, you don't have like a lot of opportunities to to cope with tolerances because in the end you have to find the beginning, and so you don't have a gap. So when the really it's called the sky bars up, up above here and something fantastic place. For the in interior, we went again for the ash and have like a, another very touristic image. And we want to bring some new architecture over there, not another very like kitsch architecture like normally in the Alps. You see like something rubbish put up there, which does not respond to any tradition we have in the Alps. That's something combined by all styles you have all around the mountains. So we want for a went for a completely new design, a new architecture. We had like ovens with handmade tiles on, on it. It's a pretty amazing, the, the, the project is in Germany, so handmade tiles are amazing. The more with like very nice toilets and, and, and think about all the rounded shapes prefabricated in the valley brought with a helicopter and it's just installed. It's this kind of uh, an accuracy and the craftsmanship you can ask for. There's, there's people around able to do this and that's the most fun that such a point will meet his angles. Like it's very impressive to see people doing that. Using all these steel parts and, and the wooden parts come together. It's an amazing quality up in the mountains. This is the sky bar, and the client has at the moment the, the last uh, to stop the the uh, the service at five o'clock, and then he has an, he struggles to get the people out of the restaurant. <laughs> this is a very uncommon problem. So, thank you very much for your attention. Like Kim Chan Thank you. Please. That's something I don't know in detail, but <clears throat> I couldn't even make a good guess. Is it significant? No, it is not, Be because everything is lightweight. So, and and, and prefabrication goes on standard trucks and standard lorries. So, it's pretty common, and the distances are normally not very big. It's, something transport is a problem if you think about a, pro a project in Vancouver but production is far from the erection point in Austria it's always pretty narrow um, a couple uh, a few questions actually um, your detailing has obviously been an evolution over time is that still proprietary, or do you actually share that and make that available to other uh, architects or designers? Yeah, for sure we do. You do, yeah. There's a lot of coverage in, on the web page because it's our belief that if you share it, and the, the wooden community is like very open in Europe. So this the one thing that is very cool about that is everything is small. After a few years, you know everyone, and so we all lived from for. 
uh, with the same goal to bring more wood into the business and, and if I cover my knowledge no one goes from that point further on so we share details, we share plans, we share experiences. It's our own advantage to, to get more business. Uh, pays, I, I can tell a lot of samples that pays off every time. Get something back from sharing something. And then who, the, the data uh, website, who funded that? Yeah, that's a fantastic point. Like That popped up this uh, Austin State. It's the uh, uh, Holzforschung Wood Research Austria. And they started that. And the funny thing, that's a European thing. After that, the Germans started one, and the Swiss started a third one. So we have three at the moment. And you don't, and at the moment, they, they work on an approach to interconnect them. So you can, like, a, a real big database. and. Uh, the crucial thing about this, there was a change in the codes that do not allow to do unapproved constructions anymore. So every construction has to be approved, and there's just a few laboratories, and most of them are owned by the state or by something like research financed by the state. So they take all them, all the, the the testing things, and put them on a database. So you have like a full coverage what is going on in the wood business, and if you, the mo the, one of the biggest problems you have to face, you have to know at the beginning what parts you use, where you end up. Like you can't do a sound test while designing a, a building. You need like a, an idea where you end up. Like is it 60 dB for impact sound with the whole construction? Do we have like a fire persistent uh, fire resistant guarantee for 90 minutes if you require it? Because this makes wooden constructions more predictable. It's, it's very important that, that you have you can meet the budgets. You can foresee what the the permission will ask the, the authority will ask you for for fire protection, for example. Is there sorry, but these are related. Are there any opportunities to collaborate uh, with the Canadian government or organizations uh, uh, organizations in, in the timber industry, um, particularly in light of potential changes in NAFTA and kind of restructuring potentially the timber industry, that we could build a kind of cross-Atlantic, uh, build up the database that way? Yeah, that would be a cool idea. Like, they're trying that in Europe, and I'm very skeptical about, like, that's so far away, and then the testing methods are different. I've learned with a project in, in Vancouver, so you need something that translates these things, but it would be the cool thing to have one big database or something that really, that collects all the data, because there's no sense in, in doing it uh, in Austria, in, in Switzerland, and in Vancouver, or in Toronto again and again and again, and then with the same results. That's something that I learned from the concrete industries. They, are very focused. They first look where is something, uh, is there any research on the world done to a particular point? And only if they find out that there's no research, they start their own. And they share it to the concrete world. They put a lot of effort and a lot of money in that process. And the amazing thing is every year they invite me to show, to, to look at what we're doing. At what point, what risk they, are, at, at what risk they, we put them in, <laughs> if we use timber hybrids? Is it more timber or is it hybrid? But it's concrete. So they have like a, a lobbying organization. They meet every year and they have these interchange programs where all these five continents, like they have like heads of the continents and they interchange. We do research on that particular point and we do research on that particular point. So they have like knowledge about each other. So they have like an easy way to get information from one continent to the other one. And that's missing in the wood business because the wood business is very, very small. Like the average uh, carpenter in Austria has, I think, 10 employees. And you can imagine there's not much room for research or something like that. So it needs to, it's, it's a crucial need that we interconnect each other wherever we are. But I think the problem is in the detail. If you, have, uh, if you wanted to 
just ask them. They, just at the moment, like Herman is in, in uh, Herman Kaufman is at, at the, uh, as a professor at the university tries to interconnect the Switzerland and German and Austrian database. So he might be the person to give you like an, an answer if it's possible, doable. Sure. Last quick question: How much is a drink at the Sky Bar? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, actually, it's extremely expensive. Get up there. <laughs> the, but it's nice to you. Uh, just, just wondering about the difference between going full CLT and going with the hybrid or the, the uh, combination concrete and wood. Uh, obviously, there seems to be some real exam advantages of going with concrete. One, obviously, is, is thermal mass, which really helps in the energy performance of the building. Yet, with UBC, you wound up uh, going with full CLT. So I was just wondering, maybe you could talk about at what points are there advantages of going to the hybrid versus going full CLT? One big advantage of the hybrid is that you can do it in, in, in regions where you have to have an uncombustible layer. That is I pretty much all Europe asks for that. The situation in Canada is different. The testing method, the, the fire testing method is different. Whereas we in, in, in Europe we test like the perfect system. No cracks, no everything is perfect, burn the, burn it down and then you have 90 minutes. In Canada, you have to have like, I think 2% of leaks, of cracks, of imperfections. That, le that leads to a totally different focus on that. The, I think it's the, the, the better approach to that because that's the reality. You have cracks, you have like movement from moisture. So you, you, having all these imperfections in the testing method, is, is a very good idea, but that changes later on. Everything we do a lot in uh, we do a lot with jarring, whereas the Canadians do like to cover or the plaster uh, cover the the wood. The main thing why we didn't use the the timber hybrid in in, in Vancouver was the, the heavy loads on top of. Uh, the, on top of the building because the concrete slab is heavier, so it's hard to get the forces from the earthquake down to the to the ground. And in in Europe, we don't have that kind of earthquake loads. We have reduced the loads. CLT has the disadvantage that uh, it's a very imperfect material. You have like cracks and stuff like that, and, and that's something that I would say. It's a difference from Austria to Canada. You test with all the cracks in, but in the end, you accept more than you dis uh, th There's more accepted than in Austria would be accepted because the, if, you, if it comes to charring, uh, the burning of the wood protects the wood, you have to be 100% sure about the construction uh, uh, and, uh, and the imperfections. And so I think there's no clear answer well, what to, to prefer. I, I did both and uh, I like to be more like just use the CLT because it's simpler, it's easier. But I would doubt that, that if you have like an acoustical problem or an acoustical high performance slab, you will need the masses they did a grouting on top, four centimeter grouting on, on top of the CLT for the acoustic performance. But that's not that much. In, in Austria, we'll have to do like six or seven centimeters, and then you're already low bearing. But in the composite safety, we're also using the slab to for the wood? Yes. So that's an advantage to the Yeah, for sure. I think the, the biggest advantage is that the, the later developments, like with the uh, um, heating and cooling device was that you better fit into the market. So for the ICDM and the ICD-1, we had the, the price per square meter slab was, I guess, around 200 euro. And you have to add another 100 euro per square meter heating and cooling device. So very expensive. And there was, even, the, even if the numbers go up in slabs you produce, the problem is always it's too expensive. So we looked for a way to get cheaper. So you, we packed more in the package. So they have like a heating and cooling device and we ended up, 
we are just at the project, we're down to 125, uh, 125 uh, euros per square meter. And you must recognize the same span in concrete means in Europe 100 euro per square meter. So you're pretty close to the market and just a tick better because of the visible quality of the wood. So you're just a little bit more in, you're com more competitive. See, I, I can't hear you. When you use cooling for this lab to get the compensation, do you find that? Like I read that we usually use it here for heating but not for cooling because the cooling gets compensation in this lab. Yeah, the surface is big enough so we don't have to go that low on temperature. So it, it works, yeah. We have like sensor for the condensation problem, but we did uh, the Wagner building and it performs pretty well. You guys do a lot of research at your firm. It's really nice to see that. But I was wondering, with all the new uh, sort of construction techniques that you guys are exploring, how is your relationship with the, uh, the contractors that you work with and with the clients to like, finance and the research? Yeah, the funny thing is that a lot of our clients want that kind of experience. They're, they, they're asking, they, they know us from, from the buildings we did in the past. And, and to be honest, like, the interesting part of the, of the job is to, do every, to invent the wheel every two weeks. So that's kind of an architectural thing that, that we're very much into. And, and there's a lot of things that we, we have a lot of discussions in the office with lessons learned. Everything is a little bit new. As I started, there was nothing like a CLT on the market. And then CLT came and no one knew how to handle that. And, and, and what is the visible quality? What is the accuracy of what? How does it perform? How is it acoustically? So you build one thing and then you learn something from that. And still, I think we have a lot to improve to get closer to the concrete industry. We will never meet, we'll, we'll never meet their budgets, but we, we can come closer and be better than them. And that's, that's kind of like the challenge to do something more sophisticated. I was, uh, uh, I think a month ago, I was in Oslo and, and there was a professor who told me the only thing that the wooden, con the wooden construction has to do in the future is to get cheaper. And I asked him why? To shift labor towards unskilled labor? That's the only way you can be cheaper. We want to have like we have like the, our carpenters, they're highly educated. If you use a lot of CLT, he gets an installer of CLT panels. He does not need his knowledge, his education and stuff like that. He is like, he is like an, an engineer's degree in Austria. So he wants to be treated like a specialist, not like just one installing pieces and screwing things down. So if you have like a a, a a healthy market we should have we should have skilled labor it's important it's crucial it's and the market always you can see it all around here nothing is cheaper than dirt and, and that's a true thing if you want to have something reasonable you have to pay for it but in the end it will pay it pays off because the, the money stays in the region. In, in Forberg, that's proven for sure that everyone has a relative who is carpenter or is in the forest business or whatever. So you're pretty aware about the fact if you just order by Amazon a window from somewhere, all the, the businesses in the valley nearby do not earn money. And if they don't earn money, they can buy the wood from the foresters. If the foresters don't earn money, the trees get old in, in, because they don't cut them. And if the trees get old, they fall, and we have landslides, and we have avalanches. So there's a complete cycling. And if you break the cycle at one point, the rest is not working anymore. And we are just at the point that that is going to happen, I'm pretty sure. And, and the fantastic thing I'm tour is I'm touring around the world, and then we're not better than anyone else here. The only thing is that this region had been so poor for a long time that the carpenters did not vanish away because it was always the cheap man's house.
today, a wooden construction, a wooden house is something that people are proud of. That's, you have done it, you, you, you made it, you have a wooden house. That's a completely change over for the uh, wooden business. And that's what, that's the only thing that we're better in. The rest is, gift of, give, you find gifted people all over the place. Just ask them to do things. Um, with the work that you do, do you guys work with the same um, laborers and the same uh, contractors for all the Yeah, that's kind of logic situation because everything is so narrow and you're relative to almost everyone. So it has a big advantage. Like there's a lot of Germans coming in from, from like big brands, Hochtief, and, uh, and, and they do not understand how we work because in, in, in Vorberg, there's a, a, the first thing that someone learns in our office, you meet two times, always two times. And if you just betray or get, get hard against a contractor, next, for the next building you will see the same guy sitting at, at a table and you have a, like, a hard day to get rid of that problem you produced. So you're responsible for the performance all over, over years. It's always the same people. So the responsibility that we have for each other is, is different than if you just meet someone for one building and then for the next one you're just abroad somewhere else. Could you speak about the procurement uh, models on Austria and how you as an architect are able to achieve or build your model and like within the ecosystem? Uh, I think I didn't get the meaning of the question, sorry. So, for example, here, if you want to procure something that is out of the box, it's a bit uh, different and challenging. So, over there, I know that you have like a building code that is embedded within the passive house standard. So, like when you're proposing a new detail, in this case, or a new construction system, um, how do you procure that? And how do you we communicate that to the friend, like the builder, the, the contractor. Yeah, there's a big difference. Like in, in Austria, uh, the change is pretty fast if you leave Austria or if you leave Forbeck. If if we design a detail, it is the detail, and we have like a tenant process, and after the tenant process, you get the detail. You don't face like the better idea from the contractor. The contractor is not allowed to, to have, he can say yeah, I have a better idea and, and we discuss that, but in the end, the decision lies at the architect who, to, to accept a better solution as a better solution. If we want to see that detail, I will get that. On the other hand, I'm responsible for that. <laughs> so. Um, so I was wondering if there was any, if it's because of where you grew up and how you, um, where you went to university, etc., or is it a specific event or maybe a mentor that led you to work, to do this kind of work? Or was it because where you're from? Or a little bit of everything? I think it was by accident. After graduation, I, I went back home because my girlfriend wanted to go home. <laughs> and as the world is very small, Herman called me and said, would you like to work with me? And, and uh, I went there and, and my plan was to, to go to Canada, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and after 10 years in the office, it was the first time that I thought about that idea and I thought, oh, it's gone. <laughs> but to be honest, like, as I, as I told my, my father is a forester, and there's a lot of people in the family like, who have like relations to that kind of an industry because it's it's more important in that region I come from. It's very visible. It's not like here, like uh, remote or city. It's something in between, and so it turned out to be a logic thing. And then the main driver was Herman Kaufman itself. Like he, he is like the one unique person that 
I don't know, some of you have been in the office. I've been to a lot of offices and I wouldn't change it, not for a single day, because something so special as this, some very small thing of 20 people. And with 20 people things, I, I, was, I started in 99 and still 20 people. There's a lot of people, I think five or six, there's more than almost 20 years at the same office, so I think it's luck and accident, something in between that. Oh, please. Yeah, the, the air tightness especially comes from, uh, from a tongue and groove connection. And you seal the tongue and groove connection except the point in front of the column. There you have self-closing device, like, like a gasket goes around it. And that's the point you, you, you have to be sure, sure that you can meet that point very precise because you can't see it from the outside and you can't see it from the inside. So you need a very smart or very easy detail you don't uh, you have to obey not to shift the elements because you just ruin the casket the insulation that depends on like normally we we like to use like paper as an insulation like but if you go if it goes up a higher level you have to do uh, uncombustible material so you back to a rock wool or something like that it's unfortunately, you can't use sheep wool like we did in, in the Ludesh project, which is an amazing good material for insulation. Like, smells good and feels good, but you're not allowed to do that in, in, if you go up a, a, a certain level. So the wall details, are pretty much, it's a pretty common thing. Like this. Uh, you can see a lot of these details on, on, on our website and on uh, datahoots.com. So it's we built with without vapor barrier. Like for if if you don't know the carpenter, better use a vapor barrier. If you do without, you can do with the boards and just sealing the boards. But you better know the carpenter very good before doing that. It's something that you have to rely on that is 100% done properly. One more question. Okay. Is there a last question? All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.